Chayu Radham Mahalva Kunjavi Ahahi Jaya Say Jose, Mahare, Krishna, 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 Hari Hari, Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari. Krishna. 
Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda So um, in correlation with or in unison with the devotees who have been working really diligently to make things clean. <laughs> Cleanliness is the highest principle of Brahminical life and there's internal and external cleanliness. External cleanliness probably says take a bath, keep your clothes clean regularly and keep everything clean. Suchi. And then internal cleanliness is chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> Well, these are the two principles of cleanliness which really are the highest form of Brahminical qualities and the things that attract people. One of the forms, the way you preach in this age is cleanliness, actually. When people come into a, an establishment and they see everything is so organized, clean, neat, nicely placed, uh, they actually feel, you know, that this is a special place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've had many examples of that where the opposite happened when people see things dirty, they don't come back. And when they see things clean, they actually come back. <laughs> it's actually a good form to preach cleanliness. So I know the devotee's been working quite regularly for the last two days. Lord Chaitanya performed many pastimes, and some of them were really powerful, outstanding message-giving leelas, and others were really a lot of fun leelas, but actually both were message-giving. Lord Chaitanya had a lot of fun when he did things. <laughs> Although he was the Supreme Lord, he liked to enjoy whatever he did. And of course, some of the outstanding leelas is his march on the house of the Chankasi where he organized millions of people came from all over the universe to perform Harinam Sankirtan. If you read it in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, you get a little indication of what happened. But when you read it in Chaitanya Bhagavat, 
you really get an indication. There's 745 verses in the Chaitanya Bhagavat on that Leela alone. I just did a seminar lasting about 10 days on my conference every day taking a part of that Leela. We discussed it into different levels of, and the power of Harinam is, is the supreme power within the universe actually. Can't be stopped. It is empowered by the Lord himself. Those who do Harinam are, are situated on the transcendental platform automatically. And then, of course, his other Leela, which was a really powerful Leela, it was the Mahaprakash Leela. For 21 hours, the Lord in the house of Srivas Thakur sat on the throne of, of Srivas's deities and took the position of the Supreme Lord. And for 21 hours, he just continually accepted worship and gave blessings and benedictions to practically everyone who was there. And that went on for 21 continuous hours without a break, starting in the evening and then going through the, almost to the next evening. And then um, the leader we'll speak about tonight is called Gundicha Marjanam. Hmm. Gundicha is the name of the temple that George Jagannath arrives at when he uh, performs his Ratha Yatra. He leaves the Jagannath temple and goes down Grand Road 2.3 kilometers down the road to a place called Gundicha. Um, that temple was named after the wife of Indrajumna Maharaj, whose name was Gundicha. <laughs> and it's described nicely how big it is. It's actually a compound, not just a temple. Uh, we were there a couple years, not a couple, at least, when was I there? 2000. 14 was the last time I was there, yeah. Um, but Gudicha Marjanam doesn't allow uh, people who are not, uh, if you have a pale looking skin, you can't go in. <laughs> they make it very thin. They put you on a spin and you can't go in. So we weren't allowed in, but we could go to the courtyard we stayed in the courtyard and did kirtan. Mm -hmm. And of course, some of the devotees went inside because they were of the Indian nationality. But it's a very it's it's considered to be non different than Vrindavan, mm -hmm. because when Jagannath goes from uh, his temple, he leaves Dwarka, he leaves the goddess of fortune, and goes now being led by his devotees back to his home in Sri Vrindavan, and that's one of the most intimate pastimes of Krishna. That's a beautiful pastime. His Holiness Gaur Govinda Maharaj was narrating that pastime when he left his body in Mayapur in 1996. He was speaking that particular Leela and then he went into trance and everyone knew that he was in trance and ecstasy but he didn't come out. <laughs> he left his body simply narrating that pastime. You can imagine how amazing Leela that is itself, just leaving the body talking about this Leela. It's a powerful Leela because it represents Lord Jagannath's love, Lord Krishna's love in separation from his devotees. So the whole Ratha Yatra festival is actually the return of the Lord to his home in Vrindavan. And that, that's represented by the Gundicha temple. So just the day before the Ratha Yantra, Lord Chaitanya wanted to prepare the Gundicha temple for the arrival of Jagannath. So he asked the custodians of the temple if they could, if he could clean the temple. And the custodians, of course, understood who he was and said, you just order us and whatever you want to help in your pastimes of cleaning the temple, we will assist you. So, of course, the Lord also got the permission of uh, Kashi Mishra and others. And then he gathered his devotees, which were hundreds. And the custodian provided hundreds of clay pots, not just the little ones, but big ones, and uh, hundreds of brooms. <laughs> and the Lord began his leela of cleaning the temple. 
Of course, nobody wanted the Lord to clean. Everybody wanted him to be there, but he was wanted to take part in the action. So he became the major cleaner. And with, the, with his cloth, he was actually cleaning everything. And the description of how that temple was clean is, a, is just phenomenal itself when you read it in, the, this, in Chaitanya Charitamrita. The devotees were carrying huge pots, clay pots, full of water from the, uh, yeah, from the Ganga and carrying it up to Gondicha temple. And then that water was used to wash everything. And it's described they washed the boga room, they washed the altar, they washed the temple room, they washed the kirtan hall, they washed the adjoining area between the kirtan hall and the temple. And they washed, they threw water on the ceilings. And then the water would run along the walls and they would clean the walls. So they cleaned every place in the temple. And Lord Chaitanya was the most enthusiastic. And while he was cleaning, he was also gathering straw and particles of dust and other forms of dirt into a pile. And he asked the devotees to do the same thing. And let's see who has the biggest pile <laughs> of dirt, who could collect the most dirt. And all the other devotees combined their pile wasn't as big as Lord Chaitanya's. <laughs> he showed he's, a, he's the best in every category. He's a, he's, he had a beautiful, big pile. So everything was sparkling clean. He also used his cloth, his, his own charter, to clean the floor. And while he was cleaning, he was in ecstasy. And he was, when he was ecstasy, he was crying tears of love. And while those tears were falling from his eyes and falling on the floor, and then he was washing the floor with his tears. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful pastime of the Lord. And uh, this went on, and finally they cleaned everything. And then the Lord said, we, can, we should clean it again. <laughs> Let's do it again. So again, all the devotees were there. And then it became a little bit more like an episode. Some devotees ran and poured water on Lord Chaitanya's feet while he was cleaning, and then they would collect the water and then they would drink it, or they would disturb, they would distribute it to other people. And they would hide so Lord Chaitanya couldn't see them after he they did it. So it became a little bit like that. Finally, one Bengali devotee came and he poured water on Lord Chaitanya's feet and he started to drink it. Lord Chaitanya, it says that he was inwardly pleased but outwardly angry. He was pleased by the person's devotion but he didn't, he wanted to show by his anger that this is not what you do. You don't, in the temple of the Lord, you don't, you know, you don't honor the devotee. And so he showed angry, anger, and then he called Sarup Damodar Goswami, his personal assistant, and he said, your Bengali devotee, he has embarrassed me. <laughs> he has c caused me to commit an offense, so do something. <laughs> so Sarup Damodar went over to the devotee, and grabbed him by the neck and gently pushed him out of the temple. <laughs> he got two kinds of mercy. <laughs> one by Lord Chaitanya, one by Srup Damodar. And it says in, in the purport in that particular verse that when Lord Chaitanya said, your Bengali devotee, said, he says, the Prabhupada says, you know, the devotees that are following Srup Damodar are from Bengal. <laughs> so, because there's devotees from Marissa too, you know, there. So there was many devotees there. So then the Lord said, this time when we clean, we will have a competition. And the one who is collects the least amount of dust and dirt and particles, they will have to pay a fine. <laughs> 
And the fine is they have to feed everyone with sweet cakes and sweet rice. <laughs> That's the fine. So that means they would have to go to the Lord Jagannath's temple and get all this prasadam and, and then distribute it. So it's described that this cleansing of the, 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 the Gundicha temple, the Lord did it again and again. He found more particles of dust. The temple was so clean, there was no dirt anywhere in the area. And that included the kirtan hall, the courtyard, the road connecting it, uh, the ceiling, everything, the whole temple, top to bottom. I don't know if you guys did it that line, like that, but <laughs> it's something to look forward to in future years. <laughs> but uh, the way the Lord did it was just amazing. So there's one verse where Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, in the purport, gives some commentary on this particular pastime. And the commentary is, is quite lengthy. But maybe we can read a little bit of the commentary because this cleansing of the Gandhisha temple is synonymous with cleansing the heart. Cleansing the heart, which is the process of bhakti, means to cleanse the heart of all material desires. And the thing about bhakti is the more you clean, the more you find. <laughs> Sometimes devotees who joined the Krishna conscious movement in the beginning of their Krishna consciousness, and they work very hard, they're real serious, they chant, they're very strict in everything they do, in other words, they do everything in the best possible way. After about a year or two, they think, hmm, I finally made it. <laughs> I'm a pure devotee. <laughs> but then again, if you stay another year, you'll find that's not true. <laughs> so because cleansing the heart is like trying to wash a piece of, you know what a coal is? Coal is a piece of black substance that they use for burning for fuel. The more you clean, the more you clean. <laughs> and there's finer and finer and finer forms of material desires that you don't even know are there situated in your heart. They hide in different places in your consciousness. They come out through the expressions of the false ego, or they may even come out in a gross way. But so Lord Chaitanya wanted to teach that in cleansing the heart, we should remove even the slightest bit of particle of material dirt, and that makes the cleansing process complete. So if you could bring that verse up on the board, we can read a little bit about what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says. It's 135. So I'll read from the from the actual text here. Hmm. Okay. It says the translation says on the out outside the gate of the temple, all the roads were also cleansed, and no one could tell exactly how it was done. In commenting on the cleansing of the Gundicha temple, Srila Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati Thakur says that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, as the world's leader, was personally giving instructions how one should receive Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of the Godhead, with one, within one's cleansed and purified, pacified heart. If one wants to see Krishna seated in his heart, he must first cleanse the heart as prescribed by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his Shikshastakam Chaitanya Dharpana Marjanam. In this age, everyone's heart is especially unclean, as confirmed in the Srimad Bhagavatam Ridhyanto Sto Abhidrani. To wash away all dirty things accumulated in the heart, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu advised everyone to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. The first result will be that the heart is cleansed. And this is the verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is Paramatma, super soul, in everyone's heart, and the benefactor and truthful devotee, 
cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee who relishes his messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. If a devotee at all wants to cleanse his heart, he must chant and hear the glories of the Lord. So here is the right to the point. We hear this often. Here is where the heart cleaning gets uh, some really good cleaning. Hear and chant the glories of the Lord. Sri Krishna, and this is a simple process. Krishna himself will help cleanse the heart because he's already seated there. Krishna wants to continue living within the heart and the Lord wants to give direction, but one has to keep his heart as clean as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu kept the Gundicha temple. Wow, ooh, sparkling. The devotee therefore has to cleanse his heart just as the Lord cleansed the Gundicha temple. In this way, one can be pacified, enriched in devotional service. If the heart is filled with straw, grains of sand, weeds, or dust, one cannot enthrone the Supreme Personality of Godhead there. The heart must be cleansed of all material motives, brought through the fruit of work, speculative knowledge, the mystic yoga system, and so many other forms of so-called meditation. The heart must be cleansed without arterial motives. In other words, there should not be any external motive. One should not attempt material upliftment, understanding the supreme by speculative knowledge, fruit of activity, severe austerity and penances, and so on. All these activities are against the natural growth of spontaneous love of Godhead. As soon as these are present within the heart, the heart should be understood to be unclean and therefore unfit to serve as Krishna's sitting place. We cannot perceive the Lord's presence in our heart unless our hearts are cleansed. A material desire is explained as a desire to enjoy the material world to its fullest extent. This is called economic development. An inordinate desire for economic development is considered to be like straws and particles of grain within the heart. If one is overly engaged in material activity, the heart will always remain disturbed. Samsara vihishanale divini sahiya jwale judaite nakainu pa. You know that song? Brajendra nandan na ye. Sanchi Sutta Hoi Lo Sehi Balaram Hoi Lo Nita That's not in there. I'm just singing the rest of the song. <laughs> in other words, endeavor for material opulence is against the principle of devotional service. Material enjoyment includes activities such as great sacrifices for auspicious activity, charity, austerity, elevation to the higher planetary systems, and even living happily within the material world. That's a material desire. Whoa. No happiness here. Don't try. If you try, you fry. <laughs> and then after some time, you will die. <laughs> Without going to the higher realms of the spiritual sky. <laughs> Modernized material benefits are like the dust of material contamination. When this dust is agitated by the whirlwind of fruit of activity, it overcomes the heart. Mm. Thus, the mirror of the heart is covered with dust. There are many desires to perform auspicious and inauspicious activities. But people do not know how life after life they are keeping their hearts unclean. One who cannot give up the desire for fruit of activity is understood to be covered by the dust of material contamination. Karmis generally think that the interaction of fruit of activities can be ca counteracted by another karma or fruit of activity. This is certainly a mistaken conception. 
If one is deluded by such a conception, he is cheated by his own activities. Such activities have been compared to an elephant's bathing. An elephant may, we saw yesterday, Ma Marco was bathing an elephant. <laughs> it, was not, it, was, it was kind of a small elephant, but it was an elephant. It was, it was still fit inside the Pajari room, so it wasn't so big. <laughs> I was thinking, Hasti Snan, yes. An elephant may bathe very thoroughly, but as soon as it comes out of the river, it immediately takes some sand from the land and throws it over its body. If one suffers due to past fruit of activities, as you can hear the word fruit of activities is constantly mentioned. What does fruit of activities mean? That means you want some good results from what you do. You can carry that in devotional service. In other words, you do some service and you think there should be some benefit I get from that, some reward. But the reward is the service themselves. Just to serve is the reward. The outcome, well, that's, that belongs to Krishna. If Krishna wants to give you something, that's up to him. But to look for some gain in devotional service is considered to be tinged with the desire to enjoy. <laughs> so that's, this is what it's saying here. Fruit of activities means I act and I want the fruits of the activity. It says here, if one suffers due to his past fruit of activities, he cannot counteract his suffering by performing auspicious activities. The suffering of human society cannot be counteracted by material plans. And this is what everybody's trying to do, right? This is the world today. They are suffering and they have plans to get out of the suffering, which Prahlad Maharaj talks about. He says, the solutions to material problems are more problematic than the problems. They create another problem. <laughs> The only way you can solve the material problems is go into a realm where there is no material problems. That's the spiritual realm. But to try to counteract material problems with material solutions means to create more problems. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. This is an important thing because everyone in the world thinks like this. This is not working, but let's try this plan. This will work. Yeah, everyone has their plans to better their life. It just doesn't work. Mm. Prabhupada talks about, it's a little, little kind of an antidote. He said, a man, he said, I always wanted a nice house. And so I built a nice house. And then I had my house and then it burnt down. <laughs> so all his plans for his happiness and enjoying his house was gone in a moment. And that's the way the material world is. You get something, and you think it could make you happy, and you lose it after some time. Or it doesn't give you the happiness you want, expect. Or if it does, it goes. Yeah. Material life. We should always be conscious of this fact that don't try to improve your life through material activities. Just increase your devotional life. And then you'll see your material problems will go away automatically. It's like when you bring in the sunlight, the darkness is no longer there. You bring in Krishna consciousness, material life is like a shadow. It has no substance, but it looks real. Because the shadow is the reflection of an image, it has an image, it looks like it has substance, but because it's a reflection, it doesn't have substance. So when you face the sun, and then you'll see that there, the sun will produce a shadow of the image that it's reflecting on. Like that. But that's simply the shadow, that's all. But if you keep your eye on the sun, you don't, or towards the sun in that direction, you don't see the shadow anymore. So as we keep our eye on the son of Krishna, the shadows of material life disappear automatically. Here, and Prabhupada goes on to talk about devotional service. And then 
gets into monism. This is a very long purport. <laughs> it goes on for another two full pages. But I'll get to some of the other points here. It says here, well, let me see. In his practical example, this goes down the page, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has shown as that all the grains of sand must be picked up thoroughly and thrown out. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also cleansed the outside of the temple, fearing that the grains of sand would again come within. In this connection, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati explains that even though one may become free from the desire of fruit of activities, sometimes the subtle desire for fruit of activity again comes into being within the heart. Hmm. One often thinks of conducting business to improve devotional activity, but the contamination is so strong that it may later develop into misunderstanding. Described as kutinata, fault finding, pratishta, the desire for name and fame in high position, jiva himsa, envy of other living entities, nisada, Nisiddha chara, accepting things forbidden in the sh Shastra. Kama, desire for material gain. And puja, hankering for popularity. The word kutinanta means duplicity. As an example of pratishtasa, one may attempt to imitate Srila Haridas Dagur by living in a solitary place. One's real desire may be for name and fame. In other words, one thinks that fools will accept one to be go as good as Srila Haridas Thakur just because one lives in a solitary place. These are all material desires. A neophyte devotee is certainly to be attacked by other material desires, as well as namely desires for women and money. In this way, the heart is again filled with dirty things and becomes harder and harder, like that of a materialist. Gradually, one desires to become a reputed devotee or an avatar incarnation. <laughs> Pretty extreme, huh? The word jiva himsa, envy of other living entities, actually means stopping the preaching of Krishna consciousness. So here, this is interesting. Preaching work is described as paropaka, welfare activity for others. Those who are ignorant of the benefits of devotional service must be educated by preaching. If one stops preaching and simply sits down in a solitary place, he is engaging in material activity. If one desires to make a compromise with the mayavadis, he is also engaged in material activity. A devotee should never make compromises with non-devotees. Mm. By acting as a professional guru, mystic yogi, or a miracle man, one may cheat and bluff the general public and gain fame as a wonderful mystic. But all this is considered to be dust, straw, and grains of sand within the heart. In addition, one should follow the regulative principles and not desire illicit sex, gambling, intoxication, or meat. To give us practical instruction, Lord Chaitanya cleansed the temple twice. So this is here. His second cleaning was more thorough. The idea was to throw away all the stumbling blocks on the path of devotional service. He cleansed the temple with fir firm conviction, as is evidence from his using his own personal, personal garments for cleansing. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to see personally that the temple was thoroughly cleansed to the standard of clean marble. Wow, shiny. Mar clean marble gives a cooling effect. Devotional service means attaining peace from all disturbances caused by material contamination. In other words, it's the process by which the mind is cooled. The mind can be peaceful and thoroughly cleansed when one no longer desires anything but devotional service. Even though all dirty thing even though all dirty things may be cleansed away, sometimes subtle things remain in the mind of an impersonalist monist. Success of success in the four principles of religious activities 
success in dharma, artha, kama, moksha, all these are spots on the clean cloth. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also wanted to cleanse all these away. So you start to see where the subtle forms of material contamination reside here. By his practical activity, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu informed us how to cleanse our heart. Once the heart is cleansed, we should invite the Lord to sit down and we should observe the festival by distributing prasadam and chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to teach every devotee by his personal behavior. Everyone who spreads the cult of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepts a similar responsibility. The Lord was personally chastising and praising individuals in the course of his cleaning. He was saying to some, oh, yeah, you're working very nice, very, very good. And for others he would say, I know you can do better than that. <laughs> like that. So he was speaking personal praise and chastisement. And those who are engaged acharyas must learn from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu how to train devotees by personal example. Hmm. The Lord was very pleased with those who could cleanse the temple by taking out undesirable things accumulated within. This is called an art nivritti, cleansing the heart of all unwanted things. Thus, the cleansing of the Gudicha temple was conducted by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to let us know how the heart should be cleansed and soothed to receive Lord Sri Krishna and enable him to sit within the heart without disturbance. Hmm. So it's quite a lengthy purport, but it has a lot of points in there. So it's a very, you see the, the meaning of this whole process. So it's actually said that the heart, or the temple, the temple is actually non-different than the heart. So when we, well, sometimes when we, we have new people coming to the temple, we ask them to clean the temple, and that's, we, we give them that service because it's good for cleansing their heart, like that. Because the heart and the temple is considered the same thing. Because the temple is like a heart, the heart is like a temple where Krishna resides. And the temple is a place where the Lord resides, so it's considered to be synonymous with the heart, where the Lord resides, like that. So we clean the external temple, the place where the Lord resides, to make everything clean for his pleasure. And then we clean our own individual heart through the process of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Like that. And not looking towards material solutions for finding happiness in this, to whatever problems we have. <laughs> okay, so these are some of the uh, messages that we can get from this particular pastime. And this goes on yearly. Uh, we came, we came to Jagannath Puri in 2014 with a, a large amount of devotees, and we wanted to clean the Gudicha Temple. So we came and we asked them if we could do it. They didn't allow all of us in, but they did allow some of us in. And I was, I stayed in the courtyard on the outside, just inside the gate of the temple, and I was able to clean there. So. <laughs> I got a chance to do something. <laughs> so it's, um, and you still, you can go see that temple. It's, it's a beautiful temple. And uh, it's, it's, if you go straight down the road from Jagannath Temple, you come right to Gundicha. It's right at the end of the road. <laughs> so this is a nice pastime. And then he describes there the different types of Subtle desires, kuti, nata, puja, pratishta, sadacharya, sudacharya, yeah, like that, jiva himsa. Uh, so, therefore, one should be very aware of the. Uh, because uh, here's a here's a point that's made in a similar verse in the in the Chaitanya Charitamrita about this same thing, is that when you water 
the process of hearing and chanting, because the seed is planted in the heart of the devotee by the spiritual master. And the, and the fertile ground is your devotional service, and the watering process is hearing and chanting. So you know if you have a ground of dirt and you plant a seed and then you water it, it's going to grow. But what else is going to grow? Weeds will grow up along with the plant. So even in the process of hearing and chanting, the weeds will arise. So these are the weeds that are mentioned here. These kutinata, putishta, mm -hmm. uh, jiva himsa, puja, like that. So one should be uh, observant of how one is progressing in their Krishna consciousness. If these weeds are also coming up along with the, the plant, if the weeds get big enough, they can also grab onto the plant and choke out the plant. So the, one has to be very careful. Although one is following the process very carefully, still these weeds may also come up. <laughs> so the process of devotional service is a very subtle process. Uh, and that subtlety means to be conscious of, uh, conscious of my consciousness. <laughs> like that. So. Okay, so these are some points on this particular Leela, which is when Ananta Prabhu told me that the devotees were going to do this, I was really so happy because it's really uh, a very wonderful pastime uh, and sometimes it becomes a necessity out of emergency to do it. <laughs> Let's hope it's not like that, but sometimes we find that it is. Just like when on, when this lockdown started in uh, March last year, I was, um, it was the 28th of March last year, I went to uh, Zagreb Temple. The devotees asked me to move in, so I moved from my place in Zagreb to the, the temple. And I stayed there from uh, all of April, all of May, and part of June. And while, while we were there, I noticed the temple was horribly dirty. Horribly dirty. So we got some of the enthusiastic brahmacharis together. We had eight devotees living there at the time. Uh, there was one grihasta couple, and the rest of us were brahmacharis. And so we organize every day, and the devotees were cleaning like crazy. We went into every area, we took stuff. The devotees had vans, they were piling stuff in the vans and going and bringing it to a dump area. Van after van full of stuff that it, you know, they didn't even know they had. <laughs> I came out to one patio there. There was one patio up on the first floor of the temple. And I saw 40 pairs of shoes. Now, there was only eight devotees in the temple. It's 40 pairs of shoes. So I said to Subhana Bindu, I said, uh, well, how many of these shoes belong to the devotees? He said about two pairs. <laughs> So I said, well, how do He said, people just come and they leave their shoes here and then they go. They come and they leave everything here. And it, <laughs> some people think that a temple is a nice place to get rid of things. <laughs> and they don't even tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ananta knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, they come and think, well, here's a nice donation. I don't need it, but maybe you might need it. <laughs> we don't know for sure, but... So we found in one corner there was a big pile of porcelain dishes, you know, all these like china. And it was just stacked and it was like, and they just, you know, somebody brought it, thought, oh, here's some dishes for the devotees, but nobody even used them. We just piled it in. So after about six weeks to a month, we got that temple really clean. There was an outside shed, we tore it down and we just, I was out there too. We were 
cleaning out the outside and cleaning the inside. It was just like an ongoing Gundicha margin every day. And uh, then I said to the devotees, I said, can you keep it like this? <laughs> and then there was no guarantee. <laughs> so I was a little apprehensive about that. So, But what we found was amazing. And, you know, devotees found things they could use, you know, <laughs> that nobody even knew were there. So, so, yeah, so this is like cleansing the heart, cleansing Krishna's temple. So, uh, would the devotees like any questions or comments on anything related to this particular pastime? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, is there any uh, are internal cleanliness and external cleanliness on the same level, or? Well, internal cleanliness will lead to external cleanliness. If you're cleaning inside, you'll clean outside. But if you're not cleaning inside, you won't even see the dirt outside. <laughs> Just like Prabhupada, he, uh, Prabhupada gave a statement which indicates what you, your answer is. He said, if you walk into a place that is dirty, which means the mode of ignorance, and you don't do anything to clean it, that means you're in the mode of ignorance. Because, you know, you're, you don't even, you just think, well, this is the way it is. <laughs> that means your consciousness is the same. But a person in the mode of goodness, when they walk into a per place that is f in the mode of ignorance, they freak out automatically because their consciousness can't handle what they experience, you know, because they're in a different consciousness. Like, yeah. Okay, sure. yes. uh, you mentioned this uh, fruitive. Or uh, actions, or uh, is also this on the subtle platform? Like, if one wanted yeah. to get a praise or something like this, the the gross desires have subtle roots, just like sex life. So a devotee might give up the desire for gross sex activity, but on the subtle level, it may exist in pratishta, puja. We call it, what is it, three things. Honor, distinction, and recognition. A devotee might want to be honored, or might be want to be recognized for their service, or want to be praised. These are subtle forms of, of sex desire. And if you don't get rid of the subtle forms, the gross forms can return again. This is the danger. Just like when you cut grass, if you cut the grass at the level of the ground, it'll grow back. Or if you cut weeds on the level of the ground, it'll grow back. But if you dig out the weed and pull it out at the root, then it doesn't come, then, the, then it doesn't grow again. This is what Lord Chaitanya was teaching. And we have to get rid of all, even the finer and finer grains of sand, which are the subtle desires that are situated within the heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the subtle ones are the cause of the gross ones. The gross ones you can see, the subtle ones you, you may not even recognize. Mm -hmm. But somebody else can recognize them in you. <laughs> so that's why we have association with devotees. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, how do, do we get rid of the subtle ones? Well, they say it's a process, just chanting. But then again, when those desires become 
when we recognize them, we should not act on them. Sometimes we can see something is coming up and we know it's a material desire or material activity. If, we're, if we stop it and cut it off, it doesn't mean we get rid of it, but it means we lessen the force of its effect. The only way you get rid of it is through hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Then you uproot those things at the, at the subtle level. But that takes continuous hand hearing and chanting because this is Kali Yuga, which means that even if you somehow or other are somewhat purified, the atmosphere around you is not so purified. And you also might be affected by the negativity that surrounds, the, surrounds you. And you can become disturbed or you can't practice Krishna consciousness. Just like I, I, I used to, when I said, when I moved into that apartment there where I am now, after a couple of days I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could. Because I could feel the energy was so bad there. It was really bad. And I tried to escape, but I, somehow they caught me and threw me back there. <laughs> but it was going on for months. I didn't, I didn't like it there. And now, after being there for a while and having uh, Ananda Vardhana come and do his vastu <laughs> and a few other things, Gradually, gradually, the atmosphere, right? The atmosphere is changing. You can see it? Yeah, I know. He's been coming since the beginning. So the atmosphere is so gradually as we continue to hear and chant and perform devotional service in that place, then the, this, you have to fight though, it's a fight. It was a fight for me to stay there. And I realized the only way I'm going to stay here is I have to chant a lot. <laughs> I was chanting 30, 28 to 32 rounds a day every day, and I not I'm not I'm somewhere in between now, but I've noticed the energy has has changed. <laughs> but then again, when the bar across the street opens up <laughs> again. <laughs> that energy is going to filter back in again. <laughs> so, maybe not in the same intensity, but it, so, you know, we are surrounded by negative negativity. It's just the way it is. So, just like, I'll give you another example, This not to scare you, but if it does scare you, it's good. <laughs> When people come here who are, who are materialists, they come maybe, to, they come and they stay in the temple for a while, they leave their sinful activities here. And if the devotees are not strong here, that, that will affect the devotees who live here. Mm -hmm. Really. So when we're inviting guests, we're also, they're coming and they're getting a little purified. So where, those, where does those sinful activities come? They, they stay in the atmosphere. So sometimes you see, after a big festival, the atmosphere is some like a little different. <laughs> because a lot of people who are not pure or even just materialists, they leave the yeah. So that's why it says that in in India, holy holy men live in holy places. So to keep the holy places holy, holy men have to stay there and accept that difficulty. Because when people come to holy places, they, live, they leave their sinful reactions to these holy places. And a temple is a holy place. So it's incumbent on us that we stay strong because you will be affected by people who come in here. It's just the way it is. It's, this is the subtle forms of effectiveness. Like So, so as long as we keep doing Harinam and keep Kirtan and Prabhachan and devotees stay enthusiastic, then people will we will we will not be affected so much by whoever comes. 
But if we let our standards go down, then we'll see the atmosphere becomes less, less spiritual, more contaminated. That's the responsibility when we put ourselves in a position of preaching. We also have to be strong or otherwise we go down. <laughs> Keep good sadhana. <laughs> and chant a lot. Because this is where you get your strength from the holy name. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else? Any other comments? Okay, we'll end on that note. So thank you very much. Kundicha marjanam ki jai. Shri Prabhupada ki jai. Or permanently. Yeah.